Hey guys, we're here with the happy pair on behalf of UCD and with Grad Life Podcast. Um, I'm Mark Maxwell. We've got, Woo! We've got, Mark got Maxwell. Steve. Steve. And we got Dave. Mark, thanks a million for joining us, lads. Love to see the uh, the summer gear up. Brilliant. Oh yeah, sure. This is the winter gear too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly. What That's were you up to today? Uh, I got up at four thirty. Made tea. Went down to the beach. Swam at sunrise. Sat in the tea. Sat in the beach for about an hour and chatted. Then went and did training with Ken, a friend who's 53, came and joined us, and nice. my brother. And then Brecky with the kids, took the kids to school. And then did a bit it, of work. Didn't it, he wasn't asking you blow by blow. Sorry, yeah, Recap yeah. your <laughs> day. Excuse me, sorry. That's the bit that you say. Whoa, we went swimming with a lovely day. day. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> But we were talking just there, like your day to day has moved a lot. It has changed a lot, I guess, over the last couple yeah, of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you were starting out, you would have been actually in there kind of making the sauces and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, in 4.30. Or in, in or back at the beginning, it was up at 4.30 into the fruit market. Buy your fruit but I think the beginning, the beginning bit that most like people, net, like so our business Happy Pair, and people might go, oh, they might have only heard of it a couple of years. So they go, oh, wow, you've done so much in three or four years. But it's really, it's been 14 years we've been at it. So, yeah. so since then, I guess back then, we used to go to the fruit and veg market at 4.30 a.m. and then come back and trade all day and then... The next chapter would have been learning to cook, so we'd have been in the kitchen cooking from six, and you'd be in cooking, or you'd be out serving, or you'd be hustling somewhere, you know. Yeah. From early to late, you know. God, there's so much to ask here. Let's just start. We're in UCD. Uh, which one of you went to UCD? One of you went to UCD. I did a degree and here. And what did you study here? I did. It, well, I, I kind of really uh, coming from an old boys school. I'd say most of what I studied was. I, I really had a great appreciation for females. <laughs> when I, when I, when I, when I don't mean it, obviously I matured from there, but I, I, I come from an all-boys school and being twins and two younger brothers, we had a very male-oriented upbringing, playing a lot of rugby, you know yourself, so yeah. it, was, I was, it took a number of years to break up the social conditioning of having come from an all-boys school, wow, there's all these women around, my God. <laughs> you know, not to say I'm weird, but this, that was my conditioning. So yeah. I did study business, but I can't say I was that taken by it. I, right. I learned how to pass exams and I did fine in my exams. And, uh, I was told it was a very practical thing to study, so I, I, I did it. Yeah. I did the exact same Yeah, and I, I can't say I was wildly passionate about, oh my God, I can't wait to go into like macroeconomics today. I'm just so fascinated with, you know, growth curves and, and reading through a book. Yeah, you yeah. know, I, I did it because I had to. But well, what I really studied and enjoyed was the social interaction. Yeah, sure, yeah. And what would be, have been your individual visions back then? So when you're in college and people are thinking, oh, I'm going to go off and I'm going to be a billionaire, I'm going to travel the world or whatever it is. What is it that you guys had in mind at that stage in your lives? I think at that stage we were, uh, as Steve said, we came from all boys schools and all, you know, all male family. And like back then we were, you know, we were playing semi-pro rugby when we were 19 and 20. So we get 50 pounds when you won a match and you get 50 pounds if you score a try. This was pounds, this was before Euro. Yeah. Um, I nearly went pro in golf. I went to South Africa after college to go be go go try to be a pro in golf. We were doing male modeling, like we'd bought into that, and we were we totally bought into the kind of American dream of money makes you happy. So we were. Um, I was flirting with the idea of being an investment banker. You know, I we could had make, the idea make a million by the time I'm thirty. Yeah. Well, make an easy quick million, and then quick million, yeah. And then I'll do what I'm interested in. <laughs> you know, so it was very idea. money. I think our definition then was much more money orientated, and then yeah, uh, okay. and then we went. We kind of threw that out the window and went on a went off traveling for a few years. And you went to separate places. You went to yeah. South Africa to play golf yeah. and you went up to Canada. I went to, yeah, yeah, Canada. Where you used to get a helicopter to work every day. Is that yeah, right? yeah, yeah, I went to tree planting. Yeah, that was... Yeah, yeah very cool. Places, yeah. And then you kind of, you, like you met the Aussie surfer, which I love. And yeah. you met, you had your influences down in South Africa as well. And they kind of got you thinking differently about food and health and values, etc. I think it was more the first time I'd been away, like because as identical twins, you grew up in one of those pocket and you were always, ah, oh, Flynn twin, or which one are you? Or, yeah. you know, and you sat beside one and then you always, you never to question yourself because you always had, there was two of you, you had a force field, you never had to kind of be individual or be vulnerable. Yeah. So it was the first time I was vulnerable, I was by myself, I had no, I, I'm missing most of my identity, so I had to kind of question everything, and it was a huge kind of couple of years of transformation in terms of figuring out who I was independent of him, and I guess at the time I was reading all sorts of different books or whatever, and I think that was the books and the kind of, my own experience catalyzed me start questioning my diet and changing yeah, it. Okay. And, I guess I became, as soon as I got there, I didn't want to cook meat, I didn't want to buy meat. I don't right. know why exactly, but I think probably from what I was reading. And, yeah. and what age were you when you moved back? Uh, we were 24 when we came back and started Happy okay. Prayer, yeah. So yeah. coming back at 24, you grew up in this kind of like all boys environment and then yeah. you, went, you kind of went off and your values dramatically changed. Yeah. You know, from the kind of money and meat, et cetera, to this 
whole vegan lifestyle and realizing what's really important in life. And it's a total overhaul of your values. Mm. What was it like to come back, having had your values dramatically changed while overseas, into the environment in which you previously had those old values, mm. and in which all of the people from your old life still had those same values? And yeah. you were going to take massive action. You were going to start this business based on the new values while surrounded by your old ones. Yeah, yeah. What was that good. like? I mean, there's so much going on there. It was quite a shock to a lot of, like, even, like, I often say the story when we came back and mom and dad's friends from, like, the golf club and the bridge club, it was like, what happened to the lads? Like, like they went to university, they were really good at sport, they were going places, and then they drive a van, they smell really bad, and they sell vegetables. Yeah. Like, they're definitely selling drugs out the back. There was this kind of... Like the poor lads, what I think was there was definitely a sense of pity. Really? Was that what yeah. the, and then, yeah. well, well, like, that was a perception? Oh yeah, well, and then, then you, you grew up playing rugby, so you know the kind of pack mentality. and You know, it's very drink orientated and like it's very alpha. alpha. Very alpha. And we came back, we had left like alphas, you know, short back and sides, Nike Air Max, you know, Ralph Lauren shirts. And that was what we left with. And we came back with long hair and plaid pants and polyester shirts. And we painted our fingernails. We didn't drink anymore. We were a pair of vegans. We did yoga. So like... We none of, we couldn't relate to any of our old friends, yeah. so we had to. And re- they couldn't relate to us. Sure. So it was a total mutual kind of like, whew, let's park this one for a while. So we had to go re- like find out other people that were interested in the same nice. stuff. So, so it was a total within within your own environment where you grew up, where you were all you know you didn't want to disrupt things too much. We had started this business, which was yeah, it was really interesting. Like I think the fact that it was two of us made it very easy because. If sure. there's two of you and you're having a good time, you tend to attract people. And the whole yeah. goal of the business was to use the vehicle of business as a means to create social change. Okay, let's zoom in on that because I've gone through a mini version of what you guys went through with that whole find values abroad, come back, bring them in, try to fit them into your own life and it's hard. Mm. But you know, yours is much more extreme. And then you came into this kind of money hungry Ireland that was probably in the middle of a Celtic tiger. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And now you start talking about social change, using business as an instrument for social change, mm. which I'm all about, and you know, a lot of our, kind of our generation are now. But back then, that was a bizarre idea. There was no impact investing, uh, social enterprise or anything like that. So how did you kind of, I don't know if you're looking for investment for the business or if you're selling the business, but you were selling it as this instrument for social change. That would have been very difficult. Yeah, I, I don't think we had any interest in the business aspect. We didn't right. have any interest in investment or anything. We just wanted to make the world a better place. And we figured if we worked hard at our dream and we're having a good time, people would want to join us. And that's what happened. Like we kind of, they were having such a good time. Like we were having so much fun. We had so much meaning and like, we had so much energy for what we, we were doing we, that we, well, we weren't selling fruit and veg. We were selling a dream, a philosophy, a revolution. It was a happier, better, healthier, more, more connected world. This represents hope. Yeah. You know, it was, to us, obviously like, it was an apple, but, but to I us guess, it was a lot more. Yeah, and sure. intrinsically, yeah. I think that kind of energy transmits out and people wonder, geez, what are those lads on? You know, like there's a question in that and then you say, oh, no, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't you do anything. Went to, you I don't. went to Dublin Fruit Market where it's very, it's kind of a, a place that's passed down through generations. You know, like people who, you're a trader, you're born into the fruit market and it's kind of old Dublin. And here we were, two lads that went to college. And it's, and it's very male, like very male and a kind of cynical kind of male environment. And I guess we, we were skipped in there as two lads wearing shorts in the middle of winter. And you'd see them all there grumbling away, going, I give them a month. You know, the begrudging kind of Irish mentality, a pair of yuppies went to fucking college or whatever, you know, I give them a month or whatever. And then you'd be skipping around there, you know, you know, two months later, three months later, still with just that still joie de vivre, which they were kind of, yeah. and then you started bringing in girls with you because you, you, you bring them in because they have to see the fruit market. And then the lads started kind of, they started, you know, being more receptive to you when you started bringing in pretty girls. Yeah, they, yeah. They, they enjoyed <laughs> that. Yeah, yeah. Having gone to this place, to this business school, and kind of uh, all the people and, and businesses that you have to study, it's clear to me that if you want to create a very successful business, you do have to be selling an ideal, not just a product or a service. Mm. And so, as you say, you weren't selling an apple, you were selling this whole philosophy and a lifestyle totally. and all of these things behind that. Yeah, um, and would, would would you agree with me in saying that that is what has differentiated you and that is what has kind of set you guys apart? Yeah, I, I, I guess it's been very much so. I guess we were never looking at it as a business and um, to make money. We want to f- start it first. <clears throat> I wanted to start it as a charity, 
because it wasn't about money and I'd very much thrown out capitalism I totally and it wasn't necessarily that it was socialist it was like before I came back I remember spending time in Chicago in a school which they called school for designing a society it's very much a group of utopian people looking at how can we create a better world for for everyone to exist upon so it's total dreamer it was it was in i don't know if you ever watched that movie patch adams no but he I'm, had an I'm intentional you describing this to an irish business person oh, back then good luck yeah yeah exactly Imagine. yeah and patch adams he had this intentional community in north carolina or one of the carolinas and i spent a while there kind of again just dreaming and philosophizing and came back very much having thrown out capitalism and thrown out this notion of money makes people happy and was much more about health, happiness, and community and wanted to use business as a vehicle to bring people together to, to create a happier, healthier world. Yeah. And that was it. There's a lot of people out there starting businesses who are kind of going through this idea of going against the grain. Mm. And it takes serious courage. And I'm not uh, being solicitous and saying that what you guys did took extra courage because you were going against the very core values of the environment that you were working within. Mm. There must have been hard times with all of this cynicism around you and about you and such a kind of friction between your lifestyle and that of the prevailing culture around you. I think we never, like, I think if you choose to see friction, you'll probably see friction, but I think we had surrounded ourselves with so many, like, uh, like there's two of us anyway, so we're kind of, sure. we're quite well insulated from other people's perspective anyway, and we can, you know, we, we're very fortunate that we have that. But then we, we were having such a good time, we attracted so many different people that our, our world was made up of, you know. It was a total bubble, you didn't see friction. It was like, yeah. Yeah. friction, there wasn't any friction. And when you're having a good time and you're really, you're creating an atmosphere that people are attracted into, they slowly start to kind of buy into it or, or kind of like we, we used to give you'd away free some porridge. People. You'd, meet, you'd people. meet friction, but we never labeled it as vegetarian or vegan or anything. It was just a cafe in a shop and it was, you know. There, there was friction in terms of, I remember a number of years into the business, I remember like we borrowed a hundred grand initially to start the business and, you know, it was pretty much because we were an economic boom, we pretty much did the business plan on the back of an envelope and borrowed a right. hundred grand. Um, but I remember after a number of years, like we'd, every year you go up and you meet your your accountant and you discuss the business and like do you want to know how the figures are it's like i have no interest i'm much more interested in the vibe how we're attracting people like money had zero interest so much so that the investors were wanted to appoint a manager because they felt we weren't fit to manage responsible, the e responsible to manage yeah. the economic aspect of the business incredible you yeah. really did create oh, this we were, uh, patch yeah. adams you know the, well, the we tend to be quite idealistic in our nature so yeah yeah same yeah. and yeah. i doubt you've ever um had any doubt in those ideals or any kind of, you, you've never kind of been tempted to, to just let them go or move off them. But in terms of this particular business venture, was there ever a time where it was kind of so tough? I mean, you talk about it at the start, getting up at 4 a.m. and, you know, going, buying all the food and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Was there ever a time where that was just so enduring and maybe you weren't seeing the results or there was all the criticism outside? Or, very, but, very, very, very rarely. But I do remember like, you know, they always say the darkest time is just before the dawn happens. And I remember, I remember a couple of times where it was, where you were kind of going, geez, like, we're in, like it, you know, I always felt like we were in the middle of a Walt Disney movie and I always do. So it's like, you know, you're expecting the upturn to come when it's like really tough and, every, and everything's against you and the bridge is down and the, like, the you owe money to this person, you owe money to that person and how are you going to pay for this and how are you going to pay for that? And you're, you're always expecting the fairy godmother to come in and figure it out. Yeah. And so we've always kind of been fortunate that, you know, I always felt like we were doing something that wasn't about self-interest. So you kind of always had the expectation that it'd figure itself out. Not that we'd figure it out, but it'd kind of sort itself out. And, that's yeah. and I also think if, if you really believe in something and love it, you'll work toward, you'll kind of dig in during those times. And yeah. you'll really, you, you can persevere longer than most people. And as Dave said, it's the darkest hour just before dawn. And often that's when people quit, because it's just so dark. Yeah. Whereas if you can persevere because you love what you do, it's amazing that suddenly it's like, oh my God, I didn't see this happen. Jeez, and you're riding a roller coaster then. And then you're 14 years later, how did you get here? And it's like, you know, I've been doing it 14 years and yeah. we built a lot of momentum. And the, same, and the same way, like if you use the analogy of a marathon, like we're fit people, I can only use the example of back when we used to play rugby and you'd, you'd all have to be doing the fitness tests and those trainings or Heige Mullers or all those things with the fitness tests. And everyone goes through the same pain. And it's like, if you can just get used to being in that pain and go through it, you'll probably be one of the last men standing or whatever, yeah. you know? So we got reasonably used to, being right on the edge 
And if you didn't really, if you felt you'd already, you were, you'd hire ideals that weren't necessarily about financial interest, you could ride it out right to the bone, you know, yeah. Yeah. and typically it'd come back. On that note, mm. what have you learned about motivations and motives and driving factors, given that yours have changed so dramatically? Ours have always been intrinsic, they've never yeah. been extrinsic. Okay, and being driven by a vision is more important maybe than being driven being by... Driven by a feeling. Driven by yeah, feelings. like okay. I think... Yeah, I'd say feeling more gut instinct. You know, everyone functions quite differently. Some people are extremely logical. Some people are quite, um, you know, just instinctive. And it's often it's said we have the same amount of nerve endings in our stomach as we do our brain. And that's where the whole notion of gut instinct comes. And that's why often it's seen as your second brain. And many people are, you know, how many times have you made a gut decision that you went, that was wrong? Yeah. By and large, your gut decisions are always right. And we tend to just be quite, not that logical, we tend to be quite Function just about everything good. is pretty good. much everything is about good. Yeah. And I also find if ever I do make a good decision and it's wrong, I don't berate myself about it because it really felt like the right yeah. thing to do. Yeah, yeah. it's the right thing in the moment. Yeah, yeah. And I felt yeah. like I was disrespecting myself if I didn't yeah, do that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, feel it rather than think it. Yeah. That's yeah. brilliant. And I think we used to always use the analogy that it was like I can't wait to, whatever way before we started, I can't wait to the opportunity to aim out. Like I feel like I've got all this thing inside me that I want to share. You know, that was like it sounds really weird and woo -woo, quite ephemeral, very woo woo. But How many like, chakras that day, Dave? Uh, no, but it, it was <laughs> more. Keep going. But that was just the feeling that it always was. Like we tried to describe it or articulate it, but it was you had all this something had shifted inside of us, but you had all this thing that you wanted to share with people. That's like you like, share. Yeah, we felt very. It sounds weird. Like like and, and if I could use a completely crazy analogy, but almost like the Care Bear stare. You know that you had all this energy that you <laughs> wanted to like. It was like I I don't know what it is. Like I'm articulating something really weird here. But that, if I try to articulate, that's oh, what nice. it feels like. Yeah. You know? That's my primary driver, and I mm. talk about it all the time. Mm. Like the biggest motive for me in life is to get, basically, but by the time I'm in the ground, I'll be empty. There'll be no mm. more ideas or anything. It'll all be gone. It'll be all be out and shared. And that's when you kind of know you've gotten the most out of yourself. So mm. very cool and maybe somewhat uh, reassuring. To know that that's yeah, yeah. People have weird Care Bear stereotypes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what was the vision starting at? To create a happier, healthier world and build a community and have a laugh. And have a laugh at the same time. Well, ultimately, like, if I look at it from the most selfish, egocentric way, it was like, I wanted to create a business that would support the world that I wanted to live in. So yeah. it's like, I wanted to create a business that would ensure that I eat well, that I got to hang out with really cool people, and that would build community and would create a better world. And that, right. was, that was from the most, it wasn't to make money for me, it was, I wanted to create this wonderful world that I lived in. Aside from eating better, which yeah. ticks off the, well, it ticks off the healthier and of course the yeah. happier as well. I have no yeah. doubt about that. Mm. What else can be done? What else can people do? Well, I think we also realized that like to create a lifestyle where you could run down to the sea when you, you know, a couple of times a day, if you felt like that or go off for a run or, you know, that you weren't hemmed into, I think the fact that we were working for ourselves, you could navigate the path better of, you know, yeah. of, managing your day or feeling that sense of autonomy rather than having to be you know there's obviously we've lots of commitments where you've got to be certain place at certain times but by and large if you're in control of a certain amount of your time it can be far more empowering yeah you but was your question your more about things for happiness well what can your vision to create a happier healthier world you guys are doing the, the food element and obviously branching out of that mm. extensively as well but what can the average joe yeah, I'd say like five, like five simple tips for health and happiness. First one, try to eat more whole foods. 80 to 90% of Irish people don't eat enough fiber. Fiber is a vitally important nutrient that most people tend to just think it's only for constipation. Uh, but it's three really important in our body. One is weight loss and the third one is our immune system. Yeah, it's okay. known as a prebiotic. Uh, second point? Movement. I think, you know, as we're mammals, although we think we're you know, really sophisticated creatures with names and jobs and money and we are all looking for self-actualization. We're mammals that need to move, you know, and movement makes us feel really good. So nowadays, they, you know, people go to the gym, they sit in cars, they sit in offices and they do talk on their phone all day and then they go to the gym to work out, man. But uh, what leading science is now saying, it's more consistent movement throughout the day is much more important for your general well-being. So that's like consistently moving. Every 50 minutes you sit, like get up and move for five or 10 minutes. And try to get 10,000 steps At least 10,000 steps a day and you know, so movement is so fundamentally important for our mental health, our physical health, the longevity of our body. Point three things. would be sleep. Sleep, yeah. Yeah, often underrated in our kind of patriarchal society that it's kind of macho culture. It's like, I can exist on four hours mm. sleep. But a lot of leading science is saying, 
you know, we're, we're sleep deprived. Like in Ireland, the average sleeping time is about 7.3 hours, and realistically, it should be kind of eight, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, and that men who function on six hours sleep or less typically have the testosterone levels of someone 10 years their senior. So, oh. you know, testosterone is really important for being a man yeah. and for muscle mass. And it's so many function for well, someone. For general hundreds. desire and yeah. ambition. Yeah, well. all that. Yeah. Or even so. just the best example in terms of sleep, they say it happens to, it's a study that's done twice a year to 1.5 billion people. Uh, it's called daylight savings, you know. So it happens in spring where the hour goes for it springs spring forward. forward. Yeah. So Fall back. Uh, so spring people lose an hour, isn't it? And twenty four there's a twenty four percent increase in cardiovascular heart attacks and things in spring on the day that daylight saving happens. And then October where it goes back an hour, everyone gets another hour. It reduces by twenty one percent. No, it's amazing so, just to see the impact of even one hour of sleep. So I think sleep is really important for our happiness and basically our happiness. Even when you get six hours sleep or less, typically you're going to consume three to four hundred calories more, and of those extra calories they're going to be more refined foods and more refined fats so they're yeah. going to be the wrong calories in terms of your betterment of your health Mad. yeah so so i think in terms of sleep that they say regularity is the best thing so going to bed ideally at, in around the same time every night and waking up at the same time every day you know that's what it is. Yeah, yeah 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 which is, so if you go to bed at 2 a.m and you usually get up at seven just get up at seven and have a nap you know all about it i actually yeah. i came up with this theory about two years ago that an alarm clock was just self-abuse do you guys set alarms for to get up at 4 30. i set yeah, them but i'm usually away yeah. i usually yeah, it wouldn't be abusive to your body because it's in your rhythm already yeah yeah, um, yeah but you know waking up at the top of a sleep cycle rather than the bottom of one as well yeah. and, I don't, I don't measure, I don't go quite that granular on it because you could beat yourself up and get stressed about it. So yeah, I don't go too deep on it other than I set an alarm because I'm not, you know, I got responsibilities. Got responsibilities. Yeah, you, you know, kids as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Two each? Three, uh, three is two. You three now? Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. ages? Seven, five, and almost two. Right, okay. And then seven you? and five. So. Seven and five, geez, perfect. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah, always yeah, accidental. Nice. Surely it happens <laughs> at least they can be, you know. Yeah. Twins, you tend to be quite in sync. Yeah, fair naturally. enough, very cool. Yeah. Has starting a family changed your perspective on what you're doing, on business, on... Well, you don't have as much time to put into it, so you, can, you have to be more productive and more focused. You right, can't okay. be focusing on the... the the you know eighty twenty rule you kind of generally are focusing at eighty percent. Yeah, has it made you more steadfast in your mission, or has it made you think of other missions that um, are worth pursuing as well? Or you know, has it looked as it oh, yeah, your course. ideals at all for the world that you're going to be creating and leaving? No, it definitely makes puts you kind of realizes that you you know you want. We always talked about education and how we'd love to put energy into that and evolving that, evolving schools and you know looking at those kind of things. So, yeah. but I think we've got to first build up. A, a, a decent enough business where you got enough capital where you can have a few wild ones and see you know have sure. a few wild punts at things that you, you're interested in as pet social projects yeah. you know so but certainly kids being in schools and realizing edu not to say that it's bad or anything in any sense but just there's always you know i think that's Room to the way the mind of someone that like starting businesses they look at things and they think they can do them better or they could be done better you know so well, there's, there's a lot of um, criticism around sort of education and the structure of it and how it could be changed yeah. and improved. And how it's so curriculum led and yeah, we're all and such different like creatures. Or, and yeah, it's right. basically like prison, you know, you sit in a room for eight hours a day and you're, you know, it, I think it just culls creativity in so many different ways. Yeah, totally agree. And encourages Rolls uniformity and then, the, and then the same thing that evolves into university and then it evolves into like working in an office where you sit in a desk and you're, you're, you do a cookie cutter job, you know, for a, you've made it if you work for one of the big five where you do some, you've got some limited, ro sorry. Yes. <laughs> sorry. Uh, but, uh, but questioning those kind of things I think is good. Yes. It, you know. it, 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 and I think often through education, people tend to lose their self. You know, like I look at my children who are quite young, they have very clear ideas of what they're interested in and through school and through, you're sitting down and you're being told what you should study and you're told what you need to study. So you tend to lose trust in yourself, I, yeah. I, I believe. And a very shaped curriculum as well. Yeah, yeah, very um, cookie Now, sorry if we offend anyone that's in the education system. We don't yeah. mean to we're, at all. We're products of it, so, the you know. The three biggest idealists sitting yeah. here. Yeah. We're just total <laughs> dreamers, yeah. so. As parents, are there any kind of, you know, little kind of knacks that you've taken to, uh, help with the education of your own kids that were innovative. The kids are teaching us. <laughs> well, the children, I think, are born in the present moment. I think ultimately, true happiness is living in the present moment. And I think most of our fears and our desires are born out of, you know, looking to the future, looking to the past. And I think children are incredible in that they live in the present moment. And I think they're wonderful teachers of how free, how free and expressive they are of their emotions, whether it be modern day society, good or bad emotions, and also just how in the moment they are. Yeah. And how spontaneous they are. Yeah. And I think they're wonderful reminders and teachers. 
to me. Totally agrees. Yeah. The first time I ever heard of the Happy Bear, I was in Australia a couple of years ago, and I was on a, like on this kind of tour thing, and it was like midnight. We were out looking at the stars. This Kiwi guy comes up to me and goes, "Bro, have you ever heard of the Happy Bear?" And I told him I hadn't, and he told me all about them. So you guys are famous in New Zealand and Australia. Wow. You talk about expanding the business. Do you have goals of moving further afield geographically, or do you have goals of you know what you talk about maybe education as being a, uh, a yeah, medium long term goal? Are there we had ways? we had kind of aspirations of opening loads of shops. Um, we borrowed a million and a half back nearly two years ago, and when Dave was doing his thesis, you did it on a, on a business kind of philosopher called Charles Handy. Uh, he'd written a number of kind of best-selling books, probably sold about two million copies, and he was son of a, what's the word, a pastor? A vicar or, or something. Vicar, right. something like that, of, a, of kind of a spiritual man. So he was quite, grew up in that, that similar world, but had been on the board of directors of like the body, body shop and, it, and worked in BP quite, quite at a kind of directorial level. Um, and we kind of met him, he's age 84 and had all this wealth and we kind of got talking to him and he said, it seems wealth like, of knowledge. Wealth really. and knowledge. Um, and we kind of got talking to him and he said, it seems like you're at a crossroad in your business. Do you want to come over to Cambridge and have lunch with me? So Dave kind of, it was one of Dave's heroes. So we kind of sat down, me, Dave, and my dad and brother, and my mom came as well. And we kind of talked about the business and what do we really want and what's happiness and what's success. And it was wonderful to talk to this older experienced man who had no vested interest in terms of what we should do or what we shouldn't. He just kind of shared golden nuggets, as, yeah. you know, from his wizened perspective. Uh, and after that, we kind of decided, I don't know if I want to open more shops at the moment. I, I kind of want to, it's easier to expand via products. And what I want is ultimately to have a happy life because I, I want to be able to go swim in the sea. I want to be able to take my kids to work. I want to do a job that I love. And mm. that's more important than having a thousand shops and, and a job. Yeah. And, you know, so we kind of, after that point, we kind of decided, okay, well, let's redirect and not focus on as much retail premises, but more growing digitally and growing more true products. products. Right, so we okay. opened up in Wait we released products in Waitrose in the UK. Congratulations, yeah, I've seen that. Last month, yeah, yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah. Like, and we're kind of looking to other markets and seeing where. And then the cookbook, yeah. the cookbook, we released our third cookbook, which was an international bestseller. Recipes for Yeah, yeah, it was, it was when the first week came as number one in Ireland, it was number seven in the UK. So I was blown away, and then it's been published in Dutch. I don't know, sometime this year. Sometime. Yeah. Incredible. That's pretty cool. I want to get back to that, but I do, you just touched on something that I think about all the time. I'm kind of like, there, there was very little script to begin with, but just going completely off. I often think that what success in business would do, if you had the kind of, the strength of mind to do this, to not get distracted on going deeper with the business and, you know, going, expanding either geographically or product-wise, etc. But if you reach a point where you can, you're kind of safe financially, you can then kind of go deeper into the self. And I know that you guys are quite spiritual and you kind of, you, you, you look at that stuff and I read a lot about it as well. And I just wonder if you guys have come close to a point like that where you've kind of achieved what a lot of people envision as success. Mm. You like, you know, if we go against the rules of Buddhism and put that, you're, you're on the top of the hill. From the top of the hill, is there anything else to be seen? That, or is there another journey to be taken there that can we I, at the bottom of the hill aren't even aware of? I think we're all at the top of the hill, and I think we all forget that. Okay. Like, I think we're all remarkably privileged, and anyone watching this video, I think we're remarkably privileged, and I think, I was listening to a good podcast where we all kind of like, you're focusing on this exam, I'm going to get great results, as soon as you get great results, I'm focusing on the next thing. Like, happiness is always based on the next, overcoming the next hurdle, and it's kind of... And the, underlying, the underlying theme of kind of Western culture is, more, the more you have, the more successful you are, the happier you'll be. Like that's the underlying modus operandi in Western culture. Where I think true happiness is a poverty of needs or wants. So it's, it's about not wanting that much, being happy with you, what you have. So I think for me, that's true success, is not wanting that much, being happy with what you have. That's ultimate success for me. How has desire changed in your minds? Ah, we're still, like we're born twins, so we're highly competitive and we love what we do. And we kind of like to, you know, in nature, it's often the edges are the most productive, like where the sea meets the land or where the forest meets the pastures. It's always the edge is the most creative and the most productive. So often many people in any range of activity, it's the edge is the most creative. So we tend to live on the edge quite a lot. Because it. it's more creative, it's more interesting, it's more, it's just fucking more crack. I love <laughs> it. And it's, and it's more chaotic and it's harder, but it's incredibly fruitful. Yeah. What does the edge look like for you now? 
Well, it's kind of on the edge. You're going full tilt, like in many different directions. You know, where yeah. you're. I think that the meaning of the word fulfilled is like you are using every bit of yourself in what you're doing. You know, you are. That, that's how I would see it. That you're using all of yourself and your skills and your mind and your. You know, you're having to be very creative and thinking in various different ways. So yeah. I guess more within work and all the various aspects of it. You know. I love the idea of like discovering different brains. So I never thought I was creative. I just told you I went into investment banking. I just kind of said, okay, I'm just going to switch off that creative brain for the rest of my life. And then like, once I got out of it and kind of started doing my own things, the creative brain just, it just kept getting bigger and bigger. Mm. Have you found that as well? Like, I mean, this entrepreneurial journey brings you on a discovery of your own talents and your, what you have to offer, be it creativity or the, the social side of things. Has that been a theme for you guys at all? Yeah, I think, I think the theme which I would have is there's all words like entrepreneurial or social or whatever. Like we all have these skills. It's just kind of, the journey inside into trusting more in yourself and believing more in yourself, like, and uh, not looking outside of yourself. Like, as we said back with education, it was always looking outside of yourself for validation. Can I go to the toilet? You know, can I do, you know, and it was always looking outside of yourself. So I think through this journey, you've learned to trust ourselves far more and be far more, you know, self autonomous and, you know. I, I think you realize how much everyone has remarkable, diverse skills that often we don't give credit to them and we don't realize. Yeah. Like, I guess in our own case, you know, playing rugby, going to be studying business, it's very kind of logical and it's very down a given track, and you don't realize, geez, I'm actually extremely into ethics and I'm really into, I'm actually, I'd much sooner have gone off and studied, like, to be a monk than I would have liked to study business. But, in that moment, it yeah. was business was more the social validation and the correct thing to do. Yeah, one of the things so. that annoys me the most is that you only get one life. If you'd another do one, you don't know, do you know that? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. If you got another one, what, how would you want it to go? Would you be a monk or would you be a? I don't know. No, no, I'm I'm for I'm if I did any less, I wouldn't be here, and I'm very happy where <laughs> I am. So, so there's, no, there's no kind of. You never look at someone in a position and say, oh, like, not desirous or envious at all, but curious about what that... Course. But I guess, but the curious, the curiosity and then also knowing, having enough faith in yourself or being brazen enough to go, well, if I want to do that, sure, why wouldn't I go I'm do that? I'm realizing that yeah, no okay. one's perfect. We're all you know, it's a, bit like, it's a bit like we're all inventing this game each moment, like, and because we all support it, it kind of keeps propelling itself, but realizing that you can constantly change it you can constantly reinvent it you really can like you know, yeah and you can just step out of that, that when you feel cycle. you might feel trapped in a relationship you might feel trapped in your job but like i don't know do something to shift it and you, you realize oh my god and you look you, even like most of us nowadays if you think back of where you were two years ago and think of where you are now for most people, they go, wow, I, I, look how far I've come. Whereas yeah. we're always looking forward and going, oh my God, I'm, look at Billy, he's ahead of me. Or look at Paul, they're so, and look at me, I'm like, I don't have any abs, but Paul's got abs, or, you know, whatever it might be, you know, but we're so external focused. Whereas if we can keep kind of looking at how far we've come, I think it's a different. It's easier to be happier. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Now, these are all things we're saying to ourselves. We've gone a bit. We haven't, cra we haven't cracked them. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, we're still doing our thing. Throughout your journey, as you've been looking forward, at what time have you been most scared by what you've seen when looking forward? Say that one again. At what time have you been most uh, scared only when I, only when I stood by what up, you've seen when looking forward? When I, only st when I stood up on top of a bridge about to do, a, a, what do you call those things? Sorry. A bungee jump. That was pretty Where amazing. Where did you do that? I think it was in South Africa, but I was oh, really okay. scared of heights and it, that was really scary. There's no... <laughs> but the business stuff... <laughs> no, nothing yeah, never nothing. scares me. You're never scared about it. No. Well, you're doing your thing and... You sure, know. what's the worst that can happen? Yeah, exactly. Like, there's no, you know, there's no real, oh, okay, sorry, right, we've got to find a new and game. And I'm scared, like, yeah. so you might be out going out to do a talk to, you know, it could be a thousand people, could be two thousand people, and you're, there's naturally a feeling of heightened excitement. excitement, but also that you could see that as nervousness, whichever, I tend to see it as excitement. You could see it as nervousness, yeah. whatever, but if you didn't have that, it would show you didn't care. Mm. A guy I love, who you guys might be aware of, Laird Hamilton, the surfer, big wave surfer, okay. calls uh, fear and nerves a performance enhancer and okay. said there to be... Uh, it's adrenaline. Yeah, 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 yeah. Adrenaline. you focus that, more. Really yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, like even I, I know, like we do handstands all the time or whatever. Just and before if, you do Yeah, <laughs> but I remember, I remember then, like I've realized that when there's people watching, I always do it better. So sometimes when there's, if I'm trying to do a handstand somewhere on a wall or something, if there's people walking past, I say, sorry, do you mind watching? Because I know it's a pro their performance enhancer. <laughs> and I will up my game. So I will ask them, do you mind just doing this? I've been trying to do this for 10 minutes and I can't, will you just watch me? Because my, my ego, ego feels better yeah. when people watch me. And I'll do it, like, you know, so I totally agree it's a performance announcer, you That's know. That's so funny. 
How does, um, we, we had a brief chat before just about sort of celebrity and how that can alter people. How has the world of uh, celebrity or ego or anything, how, uh, what role in your life has that played? Celebrity is a strange thing and it's something that you guys are experiencing in Ireland now and probably overseas as well. I think being identical twins, you've always been a bit of a novelty. Ah, oh, the twins and oh, look at the twins. So you've always been used to getting possibly more attention because than your you were, brothers than your brothers because there was there was two of you and you looked the same so sure. we were always used to but you know I, like as as um, Jim Carrey said I think I said to you earlier Jim Carrey said I wish everyone could experience fame and and, and wealth because they realize it's not the key to happiness yeah and you realize with everything there's two sides to everything yeah. but I think to constantly be aware that sometimes you might get I see it myself sometimes I get a bit I think I'm great and then I realize I'm, a, I'm just being an asshole that I, that I, uh, the most important thing is to be kind and be nice to people. What's you know? the catalyst for that realization? What is it that keeps you? Well, I just catch me. It. Often he'll catch me, or right. or sometimes I'll catch myself where I've been rude to someone just because I'm tired and I'm overwhelmed and I'm probably stressed from, you know, being On people because people see it. Uh, they you, you you can almost have to be a certain way. Like it's a performance some sure. of the time because people have an expectation that you're a certain way. So sometimes when you're do enough of that, you're a bit worn out and drained and sometimes you're rude to someone and then you, you kind of feel a little guilty and you realise, oh my God, it's much more important to be kind to people and be nice and be present with Triggered them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's constantly that, so I think in that sense it helps range a bit. I'm extremely high energy and sometimes I feel bad if I don't give someone that version of yeah. myself. But there is, there, like, but also know, I think so one of the keys, just back to that happiness thing, I think I got to point three, but one of them I think which is so important that we've kind of had to learn over the last number of years is authenticity, being true to how you feel. We live in a, in a real positive psychology culture that you know, you gotta be happy all the time and you know, turn it on and we started a business called The Happy Pair yeah. and you know, you grew up in this kind of pop culture, this whole positive culture and my wife's a clinical psychologist and she was like, she was asking me just about emotions. So like, tell me just about emotions and I said, she was asking, like, what do you feel? And I said, you know, I feel happy, I feel tired, I feel horny and then... Hungry. That's, hungry, that's, that's about all I ever feel. Uh, and I'd kind of totally detach from any of what modern society would call negative feelings, like I feel exhausted, I feel overwhelmed, I feel stressed, I feel anxious. We tend, to, we tend to diss these, so I think if you want to be a whole person, it's really important that you accept your emotions and that they're all good, they're not good and bad, they're so important. If you don't express them, they're just going to grow. So one thing we've had to learn is to be more, although you're Mr. Happy Pear Man and you're Mr. Hey, you realise it's like, listen, I feel tired some days too and sometimes yeah. I don't feel great. So I think it's really important to acknowledge that and in doing so, you're giving other people to permission to. So that's something that we're, we work on and are working on and are doing our best with because it's, I think, you know, in Ireland, you go, how you doing? And everyone just goes, great, great. And yeah. it's actually or not go, bad. It's, you, to actually go, I feel tired. Yeah. I feel overwhelmed, if I'm really honest. And it, tiredness <coughs> isn't a negative emotion. So society slaps a negative yeah. brand yeah. on it. Yeah. yeah, so I think that, that was just an aside on the topic of happiness. Yeah, so. no, sure. And yeah. like, so you look at you guys and like it is all kind of extrovert, extrovert, extrovert on the... Uh, you know, the, the, the brand that you have and, you know, the channel and the shop and everything as well. And so much of you is that. What percentage of you isn't? What percentage of you is introvert? A huge part of us, but we don't. At the moment, our lives, like, I guess you go through cycles in your lives and your business goes through cycles, and right now. But before we started the Happy Pair, we spent a huge amount of time meditating. We used to meditate a huge amount. Like we used two to hours spend, a day, sometimes and three hours. Yeah, a day. like we were totally into that world, and there was a whole lot of that kind of journey, and now we're totally out. And I'm sure we'll have another phase of life where we're back looking inside and writing books or more contemplative or whatever. But right now we're totally out and it's really fun. Yeah, it's right. really fun to be out and be totally in life. Because back when we were 21 or 22, we were like most people were off getting drunk in Ibiza or whatever. But we were off spending time in meditation centers and yoga places and really looking inside of ourselves. And not to say it was any better than anyone else, but yeah, was that was different. the journey we were going on. And then instead of off, you know, you know, sleeping with loads of people or whatever. We were, you know, we were both separately having this inter internal kind of thing. And then, but now we're totally out. We're like totally in society, aiming out, you know, as, as I said, aiming out. Yeah. But I'm sure it'll cycle back at some other yeah, stage I mean, where we're- Yeah, you know, it all just kind of comes yeah, in waves. Yeah, you know, yeah, 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 and just sure. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Do you have certain introvert activities that you go, oh my God, I'm exhausted. Get me into the house, get me- I'm Well, we're so used to being, we're so, because there's two of us, you kind of have a certain force field in a sense, because there's two of you, you can kind of protect yourselves a certain amount. Um, 
I don't know well, we kind of meditate. We meditate. You yeah. know? But, but what I was going to say, I, like I think I certainly love writing. I love having space to write and contemplate and read a little bit, which I, I certainly constantly try to work at creating that space. But usually it gets eaten up by yeah, same. being external, yeah. you know, because that's our modus operandi and has been that's to wrong. date, like yeah. external, external, you know, outside talking to people, meeting yeah, people. Yeah, we kind of like to meditate. I, I like to read, but if I'm really honest, I probably read a bit of book a year. <laughs> so I read lots of cookbooks. I love to cook, but yeah. at the moment, I guess we're going through that extremely external part of our lives. But it, and it I don't know when that will change. At the moment, I have young kids, but uh, you know, it'll come around again. Do you read much as well? Uh, I like I like buying books. <laughs> <laughs> I, like I, I think I've even stopped buying them at this stage because I realise they don't read them. But. Well, you're getting to write them a whole lot more now. Yeah. And recipes of happiness is killing it, obviously. Yeah, uh, it's doing great. Internationally, who should buy that? Who's it for? Everyone. Everyone. Globally, every human. <laughs> no, on the I, you know, no, I think. Well, whatever, it was written you know. just to try. Like, I guess people always say to us, "Oh, healthy eating, it's so hard, and it costs so much, and it takes so much time." So this was a product of two and a half years. It was kind of we got an email from Jamie Oliver's team a couple of years ago to see if we'd be part of his YouTube channel. His right. he had FoodTube, so we said, "Yeah, cool." Jamie, looked great, brilliant. So we used to go over. To, he picked like fourteen content creators from around the world that were interested in specific niches, and we were the veggie, vegan, healthy dad kind of nice. vibe. And then there was like burger guys and, you know, uh, meat people and family. You know, there was all sorts of different, there was 14 different people, I think. And uh, so we had to shoot two videos a week for indefinitely, you know. So we used to go to London once a month and shoot a bunch of videos. So over the last two and a half years, we've shot, so, we've shot about 500 videos. So you realize what people are looking for. What's a, you get direct feedback from YouTube. So you get yeah. like, you know what people like, you know what they're interacting, you know what gets loads of views and loads of comments. So in the back of that, we realized, geez, we've learned these things which we didn't for our first two books. So it was kind of catalyzed on a lot of quick, fast, easy things that, or the, and there's a whole section we have on plant-based meats, which are like, entry, you know, foods for people that are curious of this way. Foods. Like we've got, you know, hot dogs and doner kebabs and vegan steaks. They're all vegan, like, so they're all totally weird to most people, yeah. but they'll, they'll be foods that are people more, are more used to. And then we have a whole lot of dinners that are 10 and 15 minutes. And, you know, and then people say it's very expensive. So we have a whole section on, where it costs, us, 20, 20 costs us less than 20 euro. It takes you one hour to prep it for the week and you get seven or eight days in it. So Brilliant. it's like, we've really focused on these things. And, yeah. and then we also question the happiness thing. We wrote kind of a little bit on that. Yeah. So. Uh, the, the veggie meats, are you a fan? No, not don't a like fan them at all, no. Thing. Not my thing at all. Right, okay. But the lads, but the funniest bit is when you try them on the, I, I just don't really like them, you know. But then like when you when you make them and you go serve them to the lads in the warehouse that aren't veggie or vegan in any sense, they love them. They're all looking for more. They're amazing. They're, so then you realize that it's it's much more mainstream. Whereas Yeah, and why don't you like them? Because they're a product of science rather than nature. Well, uh, more no, into whole just the foods, taste. Really. It, uh, more the taste. Like I uh, you know, like for lots of them you'll use vi vital wheat gluten, which to most people they won't pick it up, but because we're tasting food and trying food and tasting food. I'll pick up stringy things or I'll pick up a certain texture, which I don't necessarily like. Or, yeah, fair uh, you like, you know, if you're just trying it, you might know what's in it. Like if you buy a burger from a restaurant, you don't know what's in it. But the, once, you, once the chef in, in the inside knows what's going on and sees all the things, he might want to eat it as much. You know? Right, interesting. Are they, would you recommend it to someone who's struggling to get off meat? I'm well, just trying to be a bit healthy. I think healthy. if someone's curious, I think, you know, like ultimately we're all going to die. So I think it's about doing our best and having a laugh and not being too pious. Like there's no point in you sitting there eating a bowl of kale going, I hate kale. Yeah. You know, like eat the burger. Yeah. You know that way? Like I think it's about health is a combination of many factors. So I think do your best. If you but want. saying all that, I think it's all about like typically the healthier you are, the more happier you're going to be. And I think the more, like as Stephen said, eight to 10 Irish people don't eat enough whole foods. And in the States, it's 97 out of 100 people don't eat enough, like they don't get enough fiber. Yeah. You know, and everyone thinks protein, 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 but like 97% of people in the same study get, get more than enough protein. 3% that don't are in calorie restricting diets. So it's fiber is the thing, like people aren't eating enough fruit and veg and whole foods. So yeah. the more they eat that, the more they're probably going to feel better in their body and therefore they might feel yeah. healthier and happier, you know. Two things, you guys sharing that message about protein, I think is very powerful. I can just speak for people like me. It is a very, it's, it's mind blowing to see. Tomorrow there's a talk, we're putting on a talk with Rich Rold, who's, who was one oh, of the yeah, top yeah. 25 fittest men on the planet back a number of years yeah. ago. And now is one of the kind of leading podcasts in the world. But like he, he did five iron men in five days on five different Hawaiian islands. Something that no one had done before. 
and on a vegan diet. Yeah. And it was just, I guess, a, a direct example of, you know, yeah. Rich is one of the healthiest people you meet. That's amazing. Like he's, what, 52? And fucking better shape than most people in their 20s. Rich is 50. I didn't even tell me he was there, but Tony's a cool dude. He's 43. He's a, he's like a plant muncher that's a real, really good mover. Okay, well, can we jump into a couple of quick fires before we, cool. uh, before we get off and talk, right? Um, I've asked you about your introvert activity. Steve, funniest Dave story. Uh, I was dating this girl called um, Jenny, who I always thought was gorgeous. I might be 15, I think it was pretty Something 15. like that, yeah. And I remember I was to meet her down at the shop down outside Brady's, and I was running late, and I'm walking down the road, and who do I see walking a pole in hand? Good old Dave. -o. Snake. Try to pull a quick one. <laughs> sure. she was if you were in the same position, you go, you just go along with it yeah. and see how far it went, see how far you can get with it. Did she notice? No. Uh, Good lord. No, but she Dibbles. was kind of embarrassed. She's lovely. She's really nice. Yeah. Funny yeah. Steve story. Uh, I don't know. I could think of loads. It depends on what category or genre <laughs> or story we're talking about. Uh, we we'll keep it clean. Oh, I don't know. Can't I can't think of one, no, yeah, nothing coming to mind. If they're quick firing, you slow it up, sorry. Give me this, a uh, secret fun fact about Steve that nobody knows. Um, he's hyper competitive, he's left-handed. You know, he's left-handed, I'm right-handed. Uh, he couldn't, he's tone deaf, couldn't sing a beat in a thing, you know. Well, hang on, are you insinuating that you can't? No, I'm, I am too, you know, but... Steve, you asked me facts Steve, about Steve, him. Is he saying he's a singer? Is, is he, is he no, he's brutal as well. <laughs> <laughs> no. I was trying to get him singing. <laughs> um, serious question. Aside from the food stuff and the health stuff, what is a change you would wish to see in the world? This is something I ask at the end of every class. I loved Zach Bush's uh, comments. This was a doctor in the States interviewed by Rich Roll and asked if he was Surgeon General of the States, what was the one change he'd like to make? And he said, you know, Israel developed a really strong army because everyone had to do a year working yeah. in the military. And he thought, I think we need to develop an appreciation of vegetables and farming and working in the soil. So I think. I would love that people would spend a year working on an organic farm to appreciate where their food com yeah. comes from and appreciate like just the importance of bacteria biodiversity. Yeah. And maybe I would say in education systems, I think if you could get kids excited by growing stuff, making stuff, creating stuff, get them more involved in those things instead of maths and history and geography and those kind of things. They yeah. all, you know, reinvent it where it's much more tactile and hands-on and practical. I think the world would, people, and more focused on people express, learning a lot about themselves as opposed to yeah, external no, facts. I think the world might be a different place. Steve, uh, someone you don't know you'd love to have dinner with? Uh, it's coming for you as well. Oh yeah, Russell Brand. Russell Brand. I think he's good. Yeah, he's Rusty good Rocket. Yeah. Rusty Rocket's He'd a good lad. Yeah, your man James lad. Gordon looks like a good laugh as well. Is he? I don't know he's him. The, he's another English comedian. Is he? Who else would I like to? But I don't know. But good match it. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah. If you're stuck on a desert island for the rest of your life, what will be a food? Nutrition doesn't matter. Every food, same thing. Uh, mango and figs. Nice. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> <laughs> Macadamia nuts and... Cherries, and black and star cabin. cherries. Oh, look at there you, are. just to be. Yeah, to it was the other one that was the big ones that we used to pick down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one of those times need to pull back. Mission yeah. fig, you know, <laughs> Fonza mangoes. I can go deeper too. Are, Who sorry. would be more likely to run for president? Maybe Neither was Taylor. <laughs> it's like an awful <laughs> job. Poor old devils. Uh, you know, I go for, for us. We, we wouldn't have the skill set. I wouldn't be into. Uh, I don't know what the skill set is. Um, Smile to away. finish off. <laughs> no, I don't. I shouldn't undermine it. We met. Mike, Michael Dean's gorgeous, man. Oh, he's it's a cool dude, yeah. Just gorgeous. Um, to finish on, a quote that, you, that sticks with you that inspires you. We're all going to die, do your best and have a laugh. Nice. Well, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't take it too serious. You know, there's no proof that life is serious in any way. So I think, have fun, really. I think that's the most central thing. Like, everyone's going around very serious faces yeah, on them. Right. Like, I think they say kids smile 200 times a day, whereas adults smile 15, so... Interesting. Yeah, like, we take, we sit, we're very serious, you know, we yeah. don't like having fun, we have to, we have to schedule things called sports to play, whereas kids, like, play all the time, and they're running, and they're 20 playing. 20 days a year to do what you actually like if you're in full-time employment, it's mad. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, I yeah. really do get around the mission you guys have got going on, I think it's very cool, and you're doing a great job, as you well know. And thank, thank you for so doing what you're doing. Thanks, 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 and guys, check into the, uh, the Grad Life podcast and to the UCD alumni series. They've got some amazing talkers, Exhibit A, uh, coming in the next couple of months. So stay tuned, follow UCD on LinkedIn and um, see what they've got coming up.